Welcome to this first of three short lectures on our model of saving. Uh, this is an application of consumer theory and we're going to develop it in stages. In this video we're just focusing on how to draw the diagrams, how to fit this uh, question of how much to save versus how much to consume into our consumer theory framework. And to make this problem tractable, thinking about how much do you want to save today and versus consume, uh, we're going to have to make some assumptions to simplify things. So our, our main assumption is going to be that you have some income you start with and that's all the income you're going to get so you're just given a hundred dollars and you don't get anything after that and the second assumption is that you only live for two periods the reason we assume that is not obviously it's not realistic it's because we want to be able to fit this onto this two-dimensional diagram if there were many many periods then we'd have many many potential goods you could consume in period one and two and three and four and we wouldn't be able to plot that on a two-dimensional graph all right so then our question is basically, how much do we want to consume in each period? So the goods are not going to be savings versus consumption, even though we conceptualize this as a model of savings, just like our model of labor supply, the saving here is going to be implicit. Uh, so the two goods are consumption today, or consumption in period one, I'll call that C1, and then consumption in period two, C2. And to reiterate, the reason savings doesn't show up here is just like in our labor-leisure model, savings is like labor. It doesn't provide utility directly, so it's not going to be a good that shows up on the graph. It provides utility indirectly because the more you save, the more you'll be able to consume in that second period in the future. Uh, so you'll get cons you know you'll get the utility from that consumption, and that's that that's the way savings leads to utility. It's indirect. All right. So now we want to plot a budget constraint like we normally do, and we can go ahead and the, the, the easy one to get, the easy point is, is our point on the x-axis. The maximum amount we could consume today in period one is the entire $100. So this point's just going to be $100. And then our standard method of getting the budget constraint is then finding a point on the y-axis, the amount we could consume in period two if we did no consumption in period one, and connect those dots. So I'll go ahead and connect these dots here to get our straight line budget constraint. And now we just have to think about how much could I consume in period two uh, if I saved all my money? Well, if you saved the hundred dollars, you'd have a hundred dollars in period two and then you could consume all of that uh, money then. But if you save, you also get paid interest. So the maximum C2 is, at, is gonna depend on the interest rate. And um, we're going to just call the interest rate R, so R is our interest rate. We'll make this a little abstract. Uh, and then we'll think about how much we could consume. So we'd have the $100 plus interest, and if your interest rate is R, the interest you get is R that rate times the amount you save. So the maximum you could consume, and I'll write it out over here, we'll call this C2 max, is going to be the $100 that you saved plus R times the $100 you saved for your interest income. And as you can see, if you pull the 100 out, this just becomes 100 plus, or 100 times one plus R. So that basically the secret is, or the, you know, the, the thing to remember is that your maximum consumption in period two is gonna be your total income, here are the $100 times one plus R. All right, 100 times one plus R. And then if we calculate the slope, typically the slope is the price ratio. Here, we don't really have explicit prices for consumption because we're thinking of consumption as like just dollars. You, you know, a dollar of consumption costs a dollar in period one, a dollar of consumption costs a dollar in period two. So you might expect this price ratio to be one and thus the slope would be one, but if we calculate it, we can see that the slope, or at least the absolute value of the slope is one plus the real interest rate. And the reason is that, just like in our labor leisure model, we can think of this in terms of opportunity costs. And it's probably easier to think of it that way than in terms of a price ratio. The opportunity cost of giving up, the opportunity cost of getting one more unit of consumption today is that you have to give up a, a dollar of consumption tomorrow and the interest income that you could have gotten by saving. So as we move along this budget constraint, as we move down, each 
each dollar extra we get by moving right, each extra dollar of consumption in period one costs us one plus R units of consumption in period two. So essentially, uh, because of the interest, this is not a one-to-one -one trade off and we're not gonna see a one-to-one, -one, uh, uh, like a slope of one. Finally, I just wanna draw some attention to some implications of the slope being one plus R. The first one is that if the interest rate changes, the slope's gonna change. So we're, we're not gonna have this point change on the x-axis. We're just gonna see the y-axis move further up for higher interest rates or further down for lower interest rates, and the slope will steepen or flatten as interest goes up or down. Uh, that's gonna be important in our next video where we start thinking about the how you would respond to an increasing interest rate. Would you consume more today, less today? That has implications for your saving. And we'll think about this in terms of substitution, income, and total effects with a table like we did in our labor supply model. So that will be our goal in the next video. I hope to see you there.